In 1860, white North Carolinians considered themselves a lucky lot. Their farms were prosperous, and financial prosperity as a whole seemed to be getting better in the United States. Scenic sandy roads meandered across the state, connecting the farms to the still small cities. For the whites, it must have seemed a rural paradise. Yet one issue lay unresolved since the American Revolution. The words of Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, were echoing across the northern states. At the same time in the South, more and more people resented the North's constant meddling in their aristocratic lifestyle, and the catchphrase, states' rights, was increasingly used. When war finally came, North Carolina would be the last Southern state to secede. This fact would not be forgotten in the newly formed Confederate government, and some lingering doubts as to the loyalty of the North Carolinian people to the Southern cause would lay in the back of Confederate bureaucrats' minds and affect the flow of military resources to our state. This situation for North Carolina would eventually be the knife in the chest of the Southern cause. It should be noted that there were a few Northern generals, surprisingly George McClellan being one of them, that saw North Carolina as a major part to winning the war. In hindsight, it is debatable whether the South was lucky that the North did not adopt McClellan's plan to take North Carolina. If this had happened, then maybe the war would have ended much sooner with less loss of life. This we will never know, but what I do know is that North Carolina was the most important state to the Southern cause. It was now the year 1860, and the United States had elected Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, winning only 40% of the popular vote over three other candidates. Shortly after this election, the call went out. For war. Much is written about the great land battles in northern Virginia and the other battles in the west. The importance of the coastal area of eastern North Carolina seems to have been neglected as much today as it was back in 1861. If one were to look at a map of the old Confederacy, they would immediately notice North Carolina's central geographic location. And when you factor in the north-south railroad routes, it is obvious that North Carolina was of great importance to the south. Restating the obvious, North Carolina gave the Confederacy what it needed most, money, material, and men, to wage war against the industrial north. Its coast was that main artery that supplied all these things, until the last remaining port, Wilmington's Fort Fisher, was taken in January 1865. It is no coincidence that the South surrendered two and a half months later at Appomattox, Virginia. For most of the war, Blockade runners slipped in and out and transferred their supplies to the Great Railroad Junction at Goldsboro, thereby supplying the Southern armies in Virginia with those badly needed supplies. This reality was never realized by Jefferson Davis and his inept Confederate bureaucracy. They were followers of Lee, Longstreet, and Jackson, and the great land battles in and around Richmond. But as any good tactician knows, an army without food or ammunition cannot fight and is forced to disband. As in all history, fate plays its role. The 35th governor of North Carolina was the politically connected Henry Willis Ellis. Ellis could have presented a good case for North Carolina's coastal defense to Richmond, and there was a decent chance more coastal protection would have been provided. Unfortunately for the Confederacy, Ellis passed away suddenly on July 7, 1861. He was succeeded by the unconnected North Carolina speaker Henry T. Clark, who finished his term. Clark did try to obtain as much as he could from Richmond, 
but his repeated pleas to the Davis administration were consistently ignored and responded to with abrupt communications from the Southeastern Regional Commander. At the end of September 1862, Clark resigned when he must have realized he was out of his political league. In 1862, after Clark turned down the chance for re-election, a Confederate veteran, Zebulon Vance, was nominated and elected as the wartime governor of North Carolina until his arrest by the Federals in 1865. Vance was a good politician and former Confederate officer and saw to the needs of North Carolina residents first which did not bode well for the Confederacy as a whole. Vance was a major proponent of individual rights and local self-government, which meant that when blockade runners made it through with their supplies, they were first dispersed to North Carolina natives, and secondly, to the armies of the Confederacy. The South was not alone in military dysfunction. The North had its own problems, one being the leadership of its armies and the outdated strategies that went with them. General Winfield Scott, veteran of the Mexican-American War, was the overall commander for the North. He viewed the war against the Confederacy the same way he viewed the war against Mexico in the 1840s. His strategy was simple. Use the small northern navy to strangle the import-dependent South into submission by blockading its ports. The northern navy at the beginning of the war consisted of 12 battle-ready frigates and numerous other small coastal craft. North Carolina's six outlets to the sea was only a small part of 3,000 miles of coast the Navy would have to cover. This would prove to be an impossible task for such a small force. The way the Navy administration planned to deal with North Carolina was to sink ships in the channels of the Outer Banks in the hope that this would block all entry into the sounds and ocean. The sunken vessels were either too small or quickly sank into the sands of the Outer Banks to have much of an impact. It was not long until the privateers of Hatteras began raiding and capturing northern trading vessels in the first few months of the war. The great successes of the Mosquito Fleet soon grabbed the attention of the Federals. The Federals would have to do something about the Hatteras privateers. They only needed a commander audacious enough to lead the charge. That commander was Benjamin Butler. Butler had also been recently defeated at the garrison of Fort Monroe, but he was ambitious and began sending his ideas to the federal administration with a plan to destroy the pirates at Hatteras Inlet. The plans began arriving just before the North's first disastrous Battle of Manassas. Now the North needed a cheap and easy victory against the South, and as happenstance would have it, they had Butler's plans in hand. In the summer of 1861, General Butter was given command of a small fleet of six ships and transports, loaded with a 900-man invasion force destined for North Carolina. Butler's small invasion force headed out to sea, and on August 27th, they spotted the Confederate Cape Lookout Lighthouse. Colonel William F. Martin commanded the 350-man fort at Hatteras. He watched as the Northern fleet approached his position he quickly requested his force be joined by the 230-man force at the garrison at Portsmouth. Again, fate played its hand, as none of the Mosquito Fleet privateers were anywhere nearby. So he had to send a man by small boat to the neighboring island fortress with that message. He only hoped word would get through in time to bring the needed reinforcements. Those reinforcements did arrive, but 24 hours after the battle had already started. By 10 a.m., Commodore Silas Stringham's small fleet was in position and began the bombardment of Fort Hatteras. At around noon, the landing craft with the first wave of troops was towed ashoreward. But unfortunately for that first wave, a strong wind had suddenly risen up as it can on the Outer Banks. The surf got quite rough and most of the landing craft were wrecked along the beach while also tossing the troops food, water, and ammunition. This included most of the gunpowder. This mishap left the partially landed northerners quite vulnerable against any southern attack. The other half of the troops were forced to stay on the ships, and Stringham was forced to move his fleet farther offshore because of the weather. At about the same time, the rebels at Fort Clark had also run out of ammo, so a retreat to Fort Hatteras was in order. As the hapless Union troops marched forward toward Fort Clark, they discovered it deserted. 
they had captured the first southern fortification of the war. They made camp for the night. It would be a long and lonely night for the Federals, and there would be no artillery support for the stranded troops. Martin, now reinforced, outnumbered the Federals at Fort Clark. Had he found the resourcefulness to launch an attack, the Federals would have little chance to do anything but surrender. The next morning, Stringham's fleet returned with a vengeance and opened up a withering fire on Fort Hatteras. And by 11 a.m., the fort raised the white flag and ended southern control of the Outer Banks. Butler was credited with a great victory thanks to Commodore Stringham's naval bombardment. Losses were light on both sides, one severely wounded Union soldier and six with bad scratches. Around four to seven Confederates killed with 20 to 40 injured. The victory boosted Butler's military opportunities, most being future failures. His administration of New Orleans in 1862 and his infamous order, number 28, earned him the nickname Beast Butler by the Southern authorities, and he was named an outlaw by Jefferson Davis. His order, number 28, proclaimed that any lady showing contempt for Union soldiers should be treated as a prostitute. Ulysses S. Grant finally ordered him home to await orders for the rest of the war. Thus ended the short but fruitful run of the Hatteras Raiders, and even worse, the rivers and sounds of North Carolina now lay open to Union forces. This was how many operations went off North Carolina, characterized as missed opportunities and poor generalship on both sides. On November 1, 1861, George C. McClellan took over full command of the Federal forces from Scott. At first thought, the listener would think that McClellan was now poised to really mess things up for the North. In the land battles of Virginia, he did just that. But his grasp of joint amphibious operations was sound. McClellan's time at the Crimean War had served him well, and he was up to date on modern warfare and tactics. McClellan had correctly analyzed the situation and knew what the South's vulnerabilities were. The Union should capture the entire coastal area of North Carolina and if possible keep going until they see the outskirts of Raleigh, which would eliminate the two great railroad junctions in our state. The railroads and telegraph lines were the newest and most important weapons of the Civil War. The Confederacy was never as good at utilizing them as well as the North nor did they have the industry or expertise to take maximum advantage. By destroying these two important resources, McClellan would effectively blind Lee and starve his army and leave him immobile. The farther the northern incursion traveled into North Carolina, the more crippled the Confederates would become. This would force the rebels to disperse their forces to North Carolina in order to protect these vital areas leaving them all the weaker in Virginia and South Carolina. This was McClellan's plan, and this would allow him to more easily handle Lee's army on his front doorstep. After the capture of Hatteras, the people of eastern North Carolina flooded Governor Clark with requests for military resources. They saw how vulnerable these key areas were. Clark did what he could, which turned out to be very little. Clark and the previous Governor Ellis had already sent almost everything to Virginia, and now was to ask for it back. His requests would be looked upon with scorn from the Confederate administration. Roanoke Island was the next target for McClellan. This island was considered the gateway to the rivers and sounds of the North Carolina coast, and also the backdoor waterway to Norfolk, and then Richmond. McClellan needed a commander to carry out his plan, so he looked to his old friend, Ambrose Burnside, to lead the next invasion, and also to capture the entire coastal area of North Carolina. Burnside began his preparations, and on the naval side, Rear Admiral Lewis M. Goldsboro was assigned to provide the transport, 
and artillery for the endeavor. Goldsboro's fleet consisted of 20 naval ships with 62 guns. Burnside had also slapped together 60 smaller steamers, coastal craft and transports for his 12,000 lightly trained Union troops. This invasion force was not only to take Roanoke Island, but also to capture or neutralize the cities and forts of New Bern, Beaufort, and Fort Macon. Burnside was also instructed to destroy as much of the Wilmington Weldon Railroad as possible, along with the Great Railroad Bridge at Goldsboro, and then march on Wilmington and Raleigh if feasible. On January 11, 1862, the ragtag fleet left Annapolis, Maryland for the North Carolina coast. The Burnside Expedition, as it was called, set off on the wrong foot as the little fleet ran headlong into one of the famous Hatteras Nor'easters. The Nor'easter then turned into a raging gale. The little ships were raked by the sea for days. Burnside lost five of his small ships to the storm, one being the horse transport with 100 horses. Admiral Goldsboro's fleet finally joined him just in time for the second gale on January 22nd. The gale finally subsided in late January and Burnside could get to the task of entering the Pamlico Sound of North Carolina. On the night of February 4th, all the ships, minus the ones sunk or sent back, were finally in the Pamlico Sound. Meanwhile, on Roanoke Island, the meager defenses were being erected. Three small sand spit forts were constructed. Of the three forts, only Fort Varto would be involved in the engagement because it was the only fort far enough south to bring its guns to bear on the invading Burnside fleet. The Confederate commander Henry Wise was in command and manned his three sand forts with the 2nd, 8th, and 31st North Carolina regiments, along with two Virginia regiments, the 45th and 59th. The entire force consisted of 1,400 men. The North Carolina regiments were armed with shotguns and small hunting rifles and were dressed with whatever ragtag military style clothing that could be found. On February 5th, Burnside's fleet approached Roanoke Island, and in another stroke of bad luck, Confederate Commander Wise was struck with pneumonia and was in bed at Nags Head this very day. No matter, the brave little nine cannons of the Mosquito fleet lined up for a hopeless battle against the vastly superior Northern Naval Force which consisted of 50 much larger cannon. On February 6th, the Confederate gunboat Appomattox was sent to scout the Yankees' naval forces on that foggy winter morning. What it saw was a fleet of 67 ships anchored just south of the island. Admiral Goldsboro could have easily battered the little double-decker gunboat to toothpicks, but he held his fire. Maybe so the rebels could see their hopeless situation. The next morning the fog was gone, but a cold rain and wind had set in. At 10.30 in the morning, the Union ships moved in and opened up on the little Mosquito fleet. Commander Lynch's Mosquito fleet was mangled, but survived. The CSS Curla managed to beat herself before sinking right in front of Fort Forrest, which blocked the seven cannons mounted there. The surviving Mosquito fleet retreated north to Elizabeth City. Now the Union fleet began to batter Fort Bartow. For seven hours they bombarded the Sand Spit Fort but did only minor damage to the muddy ramparts. Three miles south of Bartow, the rebels were about to meet the Yankee invasion force as the 4,000 soldiers were towed ashore at a place called Ashby's Landing. At the landing site, Colonel J.B. Jordan, along with 200 hidden Confederates and two cannon, waited silently behind some island underbrush. The 4,000 Yankees must have paralyzed the Green Commander because not a shot was fired at the landing troops. It was not long before someone spotted the sun reflecting off a gun barrel and a Union gunboat opened fire on the discovered rebels and they promptly retreated without firing a shot. By midnight, Burnside's entire force was ashore. The next morning, they began advancing on the rebels and the now in charge, Colonel Shaw. Shaw was alarmed at the large number of Union troops and sent urgent telegrams to Brigadier General Huger in Norfolk, requesting more troops be sent immediately. Huger responded with, keep cool, stand by the guns. There would be no reinforcements sent today. 
but Shaw was undaunted and confident his men could hold the center and that the impassable swamps would protect his flanks to the left and right. Burnside's plan had only one avenue of attack to march up the single road in the center with General Foster's Massachusetts Brigade followed by two more. To either side was rugged swamp and brush. Still, the recent rains and felled trees made the march up on the muddy road slow and treacherous. The southerners raked the road continually with cannon and single shot. It was not long before Burnside's attack plan bogged down. A single muddy road was rough on the Yankees, but it also restricted the rebels to 400 men at the point of attack, while forcing the 1,050 other men 250 yards to the rear. Too far away to be a much good. A thick cloud of gun smoke also choked the battlefield, making it impossible to see what you were shooting at. After two frustrating hours, the 10th Kinetic was brought up to relieve Foster's 25th Massachusetts. Foster saw the battle at this point as going nowhere, so he ordered the 23rd and 27th Massachusetts to leave the road and try to approach the rebels on their left flank through the swamps. At the same time, General Reno came to the same conclusion and ordered the 9th New Jersey, 21st Massachusetts, and 51st New York to attempt the swamps on the right flank. The Union Brigade slogged through waist-deep muck, only to be ripped at by thickets of briars. After a short time, the Yankees finally streamed out onto the left and right flank of the surprised Southerners. The end of the line was taken on both flanks and the Union soldiers began pouring gunfire down inside the earthenworks. With not much cover, the rebels withered under the constant fire. The bedraggled Confederate line outflanked and outgunned began to crack. The Union men in the center noticed a slackening of fire from the rebels, which was due to Foster and Reno's flanking maneuvers. Calls for a center attack began to fly up the line to General Foster. The end was in the form of a melodramatic charge by Rush Hawkins, commander of the 9th New York, who was told by Foster, You are the very men, and this is the very time. Zuabres stormed the battery. Hawkins' regiment stormed down the road toward the rebel center, who were already pulling back under the constant fire from the flanking Union soldiers. Later, Hawkins' regiment would get a lot of the credit from the northern press for winning the battle with this dramatic charge which resulted in some resentment from the other Yanks that braved the swamps. Thirty minutes after the rebel flanks were exposed, Colonel Shaw raised a white flag and the South lost the most important position in the North Carolina Sounds. The men in the two forts further to the north threw down their arms without firing a shot. Burnside achieved a great victory with only 37 casualties and capturing 2,500 Confederates. Shaw suffered only 23 casualties. Now Burnside can continue McClellan's plan without interruption. But before he could move on to his next objective, he needed to finish off the annoying Mosquito Fleet that had retreated to Elizabeth City. The Mosquito Fleet, commanded by William F. Lynch, had expended all its ammunition in the previous battle and was hoping to find more at Elizabeth City. He did find some supplies and was going to return to Roanoke Island until he heard that the island had fallen to Burnside's forces so his new plan was to ready the few dozen local militia for the coming attack on the town. He lined up his six undersupplied ships in a line to await the northern fleet, then went ashore to inspect the one small fortification named Cobb's Point. It was armed with four cannon and eight scared men. While trying to get them prepared, Stephen Rowan, Goldsboro's tactical commander, showed up at the town and ordered all his gunships to attack the remaining Mosquito fleet. The scared gun crew at Cobbs Point vanished, and Lynch called for more gun crews from the Beaufort. His second in command, Parker, came ashore with the needed gunners. The new gunners hastily manned and loaded the guns at Cobbs Point and got off just one round before Rowan's gunboats attacked and waded into the last of the Mosquito fleet. Lynch watched helplessly from Cobbs Point as the mosquitoes were rammed and blasted to splinters by the vastly superior Union gunboats. Surprisingly, the Beaufort was the only Confederate gunboat to escape to Norfolk. The rest were blasted, burned, or run aground. The town of Elizabeth City was promptly captured after panicky citizens set part of the town on fire and evacuated. A few days later, Rowan sent four gunboats to the abandoned city of Edenton, which also surrendered without a fight to the Yankees. 
The final chapter in this disaster for the Confederacy was the burning and sacking of the town of Winton, North Carolina. The 1,000-strong 9th New York, which included Hawkins Zouavres, plus elements of the 4th Rhode Island and Commander Rowan's 8 gunboats, were selected to take the town. Burnside was interested in capturing Winton because of the two important railroad junctions nearby, and that there were rumors that Unionists had taken control of the town. If true, then Winton would become another easy base for future operations. At Winton, the rebels were ready and planned to ambush the arriving Federals. The planned ambush initially was considered a success because the Yankees were driven downriver, but only a few miles. They also sustained no damage or casualties. Confederate Lieutenant Colonel William T. Williams was hailed as a hero of the town. That is, until the angry Yankees returned the next day and sacked and burned the town, which became the only black mark upon Burnside's operations up to this point. This was an accidental implementation in the concept of total war, which was used to great effect by William Tecumseh Sherman later in the war. In a week, Burnside's expedition had managed to capture Roanoke Island, destroy the entire North Carolina Confederate coastal fleet, capture two coastal towns while sacking another, and capturing the back toward channel to Norfolk. The Confederacy finally responded by sending reinforcements to Suffolk, and later, after the Battle of Newburn on March 14th and South Mills on April 19th, Huger was ordered by General Joseph E. Johnston to abandon the port of Norfolk which also resulted in the scuttling of the CSS Virginia, previously known as the Merrimack. Burnside could now turn his attention to his next objectives, Moorhead City, Fort Macon, and Newburn, North Carolina. 